We're not crazy. The system is. Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Wednesdays, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time, on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3, Valley Free Radio. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Streaming live, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And uh, today I'm really um, psyched because our guest is um, punk rock legend Bonfire Madigan Shive. She's going to be um, telling us a lot about her life and her relationship to the mental health system and extreme states of consciousness and her creative process. So that's coming up in a second. First, a uh, few words about the producers of Madness Radio. Um, Freedom Center is a local activist advocacy and support community in Western Massachusetts for people who've been labeled in the psychiatric system and who are looking for alternative approaches to the mainstream system. We have a bunch of uh, holistic services, including an acupuncture clinic, yoga classes, writing groups. Um, We do educational events. We have a protest coming up for better um, care in the local system here. That protest is going to be on July 29th. We also have a website, freedom-center.org, that you can check out all the different things that we're doing, a lot of resources up there for people who are looking for human rights, who are looking for um, alternatives to mainstream uh, psychiatric approaches. And Madness Radio is also co-produced by the Icarus Project, which is primarily an online community, but there are local groups in a number of different um, cities, and there's a growing interest internationally as well in the Icarus Project. Icarus is a support community of people who are looking beyond the medical model for understanding what we go through, including creativity and spirituality, seeing our experiences um, that would get labeled mental disorders as instead dangerous gifts that need uh, care and cultivation. You can find out more information at theicarusproject.net. Ah! <laughs> no, what do we do? Okay. Um, well, it's my great um, pleasure to welcome on to the show uh, Bonfire Madigan Shive, who is an independent musician, radical mental health activist, staff person with uh, the Icarus Project, who has um, quite a history in um, rock and roll and punk as one of the creators, founders, initiators, instigators mm-hmm. of a Riot Girl at a very young um, teenage and just one of my favorite people in the world. So welcome to the show, Madigan Shive. Oh, thank you so much. It's, it feels so great to be here. And I'm such a fan of this program and of its illuminations and of its expansion in the world. So hello, Madness Radio. I <laughs> feel right at home. Awesome. Well, yeah, I wanted to have you on for a while. So it's great to have. And we're here in this like soundproof studio at your house in um, Brooklyn. You're going to be in an anthology, a writing anthology. Tell us about because That's kind of some exciting news from Bonfire Madigan Land. Right. This just happened, actually, the last few days. I'm, I'm just coming back to the East Coast and to um, Brooklyn from being on tour and working um, in San Francisco and being on tour in the West Coast. Seven Stories Press, which is um, an independent publishing house here in New York that I'm really a fan of what they've put out. So they're putting together an anthology uh, called Live Through This. And the kind of working second title is Women Artists on Self-Destruction um, and the Creative Healing Process. Um, and it's really exciting because the anthology uh, is already has confirmed a bunch of really my heroes and peers and heroic colleagues and mentors, people like Bell Hooks and Kate Bornstein, who's been on this show, and Fly, who is a great artist, Christy Road, um, Inga Musio, just I could go on and on. It's an amazing um, Place And for me, it's kind of uh, just a different kind of level and validation to what I've been doing. Um, so, yeah, I've just I've been working to get my my uh, part of it all together. Yeah, we'll be looking forward to reading that. That's pretty exciting. And you I mean, I really see you as this just amazing survivor and force that's come out of an incredible history and past. And maybe that would be a way to start, just talk a little bit about your own life and where things kind of started for you in terms of having a visionary outsider perspective on things. Mm, yes, yes. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, 
I think I realized from a really young age I, I had a very uh, counterculture um, beginning in this on um, in this world system that we're talking to each other in now that I was birthed into. Um, my parents were were counterculture young people in the late seventies um, who who just have their own interesting story of how they found each other. And um, my mother was a really heavy-duty trauma survivor. And um, it was actually said that it was unlikely that she could have kids because she was in a car accident that so badly damaged her left brain. Um, and she had to learn kind of basic motor skills again. And my father, who was, according to my fundamentalist Christian parents, was the long hair hippie freak who they didn't want around their 16-year-old daughter, but he would um, he fell in love with this 16-year-old, my mother, little Ruthie, um, from this giant family, and he would sit outside of her hospital room, and he basically just lived there and then would do all the physical therapy for with her, and, and was, um, when uh, they were considering kind of what to do next, my grandparents, the story I understand is they were going to put her in a nursing home for a while, and they couldn't figure out what to do with her, because they had, you know, seven other kids they were kind of dealing with, too, and my father basically is like, well, then I want to I want to marry her and and so my mother, which is interesting though her life kind of was always about dependency then you know because she then became a, a legal custodian of my father because she was underage when they married, but then um, you know about a year and a half later I was born and I was conceived in a cranberry bog shack that they were squatting in. This was in the <laughs> Pacific Northwest, right? This is in Washington State and so yeah so my life I would live in teepees with them we would live in cars and shacks and cabins with run, no running water, electricity. And I think really the experience I had of living in the teepee um, put a whole new perspective on the ways you can live, the kind of um, just community and a f familial kind of experiences. Because I was really then raised by this sort of radical counterculture tribe of of indigenous people and kind of back to the land people and farmer communities. And, you know, I was renamed Running Pony by a woman named Horsewoman. And I was known as Running Pony. My mother called me that until the day she died, uh, until I was about 18 years old. Um, but I was named Running Pony because this woman, Horsewoman, who lived in a this shack with um, sh her whole deal was that she took horses that were going to be put down and she she lived in a in a stable with them and she revitalized them and so she gave me and my mom we were living in this teepee she gave me a, a part quarter horse part Shetland pony and I named it co pony and it literally was my and it would wake me up in the morning and I would I learned how to get on the joke is that I I could get on the back of this pony and ride through the trails down to where the breakfast nook was and stuff. I'm, I was about two and a half years old at the time. So before I could run in a straight line, I could pull myself up onto co-pony and running pony and co-pony would be going down the trails. Just, I mean, we think it's such a different world. You know, we treat our children so precious now. And, and in general, the mainstream really criminalizes youth, you know. Um, and so for me, having that root, that radical root experience, uh, just it allowed me so much freedom and to look at the world from very different perspectives. It sounds like your mom was really kind of part, in, partly in this reality and partly in other realities too. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And I think because she um, was a trauma survivor to such a, a physical and on so many different levels, and she was so different from a lot of people's expectation that um, – uh, she just, yeah, was an amazing force and also a force, um, I didn't even know how to explain it. She was just so much in my life and definitely the older I get because she wouldn't conform. She was a, a, an intense anti-authoritarian, but, uh, but because of that would deal with, um, you know, being ostracized and being pathologized and being told that she was not smart. And I dealt with that a lot, that people like us, we were just weren't as smart as other people. And we moved around a lot. And and I used I learned really early to make up a lot of different stories about who we were, because there was always a threat of our of our housing being taken away or or even me and my sister being taken away by things like child protective services. And my first encounter with the mental health system was not voluntary, as is with a lot of people. And it was when I was a youth and and um, 
the public school system was concerned that I was being malnourished or that I had a and and um I remember I learned though right away at like the age of seven or eight, you know, okay, I see what they want and the role they want me to play. And actually, this is kind of how I fell in love with being a theater, uh, um, a performer. And I actually fell in love with the theater really young too. And what I found was it, it was such an early healing um, possibility for me because I could be a storyteller and, and move into so many different roles and shoes. And it would free me from some of the persecution or judgment that I would feel because my family's lifestyle and what was happening in my family was so um, kind of off off the cuff, off the radar. So your family really ran into a lot of confrontations and conflict with um, the system, with authorities and the police? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, there would be times where it was it was pretty mellow, but that there, that threat was always there because of um, oftentimes because of my mother's behaviors and the way she um, just she wasn't going to conform and she wouldn't, you know, she would do a lot of really bizarre things that would would confuse and or maybe uh, enrage people just because she wouldn't play into their social etiquette. So do you think a lot of your own independence and nonconformism and, and power really comes from her in a lot of ways? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so um, important for me, actually, to uh to get in touch with that because oftentimes, especially the more um, kind of dependent she got on illegal substances and she was always dealing with addiction issues. And I really, I thread that back though to that first time with her in the hospital and how the system was always telling her that she always needed something else from outside to heal her within, whether it was drugs, um, you know, uh, vocational schools or you know, she tried to work, but I mean, she got fired from fast food restaurants because she, you know what I mean? Like she got kicked out of vocational programs because she just wouldn't behave in the way that, you know, and then they'd try to say, oh, she had the IQ of, you know, 30 something and all they would just and that would just, of course, just break her spirit down. And um, but she was so childlike and so positive most of the time. And she was a real healer. And the work that she did that I think is so inspiring is she uh, she worked with kids with disabilities and also older people. And she was um, a private nurse for a few years. But it exposed me to all these people who were experiencing reality in different ways. I remember having friends with cerebral palsy who were children that she was taking care of, or this young boy with, um, I forget the name of of, I think like Hunt, something like Hunterson's disease or something. But I found myself really attracted to these kids and the way that they were experiencing the world and found myself really wanting to be around them and feeling like we could learn things from each other. So I think, you know, at the age of nine, I was kind of involved with disability rights. <laughs> so, And you had um, your own experiences with extreme states or different states of consciousness. So wh- when did that really start for you as, as a kid? I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's also because I was exposed and living in so many different kinds of situations. Um, As I got older, we sort of moved in closer to the suburbs of Seattle. And then we became in different ways, kind of more uh, the kind of lower class, working class stuff, uh, lifestyle. So I was exposed to really spectrum. But my mom was the kind of person she'd bring home hitchhikers or people or kind of freaks from the community or, you know, because she had they had this whole kind of extended almost like beat hippie back to the land counterculture community. And I'll, oftentimes there'd be somebody else staying with, with us for different times. She was always taking people in. I remember waking up sometimes there'd be somebody else sleeping on the couch and you know, when I was a kid, or sometimes it would be like, come on, you know, because, you know, you're a kid and you want your space and you're learning how to. But definitely now I realize I've taken that legacy on um, and I find the power in it to shift out of this hierarchical culture really into a gift shared culture. One of the things that I, I think is really true about your music and your work is is this healing aspect to it. Mm. It just really comes through very clearly. And you mentioned that your mom was a healer. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. I think that my mother just naturally carried around this, uh, like I said, non-judgmental healing energy um, that just made you feel heard and listened to and, um, and also a belief 
she really had a belief system in your own healing capacity, you know, um, and we didn't, and we also knew we weren't going to rely. She she knew that the healing wasn't coming from the institutions. I mean, she had mostly only experienced harm from um, the Western medical dependency model. Your art is really vision, the visionary experience. So tell us about that. And maybe when did that start mm. becoming clear to you that that's part of who you were? Well, I mean, there was a series of things starting when I was really young. And I always seemed to have a tool or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a tangible kind of... Um, uh, amulet or something that would pull me or that I would speak to in different re realities. I, I was definitely the kind of kid who eating and sleeping were kind of afterthoughts. I was always kind of, you know, my antennas and my skin was always open to um, this sort of what was happening all around. I was always excited to plug into it and make something of it, you know, make a, a story or an event or to be a part of making it... Um, almost a performance, you know, wherever moment I was in to feel like I'm, I, I can be a reality maker here. And that was like uh, my mother made me a doll, a Raggedy Ann doll before my sister was born. And it was like my best friend. It was my I would talk with it. We'd swap clothes. We were, it was my companion that I would tell my dark, my deepest secrets to. And then as I got a bit older and we were living um, closer into the suburbs of Seattle, I remember, you know, I lived in a house, too, where my mom would go through so many different states that there was a lot of rage and a lot of pain. And oftentimes there'd be, you know, dishes flying across the kitchen, things like. And I remember kind of feeling like I don't know what love is unless it's things smashing around me. And one example of that is I, I had a little room where the doorknob from all from the door being slammed open and shut so much created a hole in the wall exactly the size of the doorknob. And I at night when I'd be up making my little magical worlds at, you know, four in the morning before I was, I'd be, I could hear my dad at like five in the morning getting ready um, for work. He's a self-employed auto mechanic. And um, I'd get back in bed quickly so that he'd think I was sleeping all night before he came and woke me up. But sometimes what I'd do is I, I, um, I was convinced and I still believe that there was this kind of spirit entity in the wall behind and that actually where the doorknob hit the wall. Actually, this was some of my first really writing, too, about my experience of, uh, I was probably 14 when I started writing about this experience, and I, I named this entity spirit that was in the wall that was could be a portal to many world systems. I called it Whisper. It was this very androgynous, childlike, because um, I was a child, and I would talk. I'd put my little mouth up to that hole, and we would talk. And then later, a few late, years later, I would find the cello, and this would basically become my lifelong sort of amulet f friend, like my a dialogue that was connected to all sorts, beyond text, all kinds of communicating beyond um, sort of these dominant languages. Did you yourself ever end up in therapy or in an institution or anything like that? Well, what ha I saw my mom's greatest fear was being put, and she actually at times would say, I would rather die or be in jail or on the streets than in, in a psych ward. There was a lot of trauma for her around that because the the Washington's the the state hospital was in the Skagit Valley where she grew up and she would lived with the constant threat of that and she had some uh, uncles and stuff who had worked there and and they had thrown some of her brothers and sisters in there when they were on these kind of 60s acid trips they wouldn't come down from and so the parents would throw them in the psych ward, you know, her brothers and sisters. And then with her own experience with being in the hospital, because um, she was in a coma and stuff after this accident, she just, she was physically to a profound, uh, she had so much fear and paranoia and rage about that. So I always, that you know, at such a young age to hear that, that she would rather die, you know. What did happen is what I was explaining, well, the first time was when the public schools sent this this uh, child psychiatrist to our house and I was so upset with them and because you know it was completely the stereotype to this guy with the white guy with the beard get a little turtleneck sweater and a <laughs> you know the whole whole stereotype you know and um, me too feeling like just all this shame like he came to the house to see if I was being malnourished and I remember looking at my dad and being like I'm so sorry I'm so sorry you know but. It was nothing, you know, there was nothing wrong but me knowing, okay, I just have to play this game to, like, make him know everything's okay and tell him to go away or that, you know, everything's fine. Um, 
And then what would happen later is I would often get persecuted by default because of other, um, you know, because my mother then would find heroin as sort of a self-soothing. And then there would be a lot of then altercations with police and um, uh, the whole gamut. And this would then affect my high school years, you know, and having teachers or whatever pull me aside because they see my mother obviously so strung out and then they're they're under this guise of concern but I mean I literally had had the principal at this one school at when I was in high school actually pulled me into uh, her office and she had called my dad in and again for me my dad worked so hard and I always felt kind of protective of him um, to have him be taken from work and basically she wanted to know if I was a drug dealer or doing drugs and you know and by this time I was getting into riot girl feminism music I was a vegan I was you know I was going to earth first meetings and queer nation I was getting totally radicalized in the most this is in Capitol Hill and in Seattle which kind of is the was the area where you could be kind of a freak and stuff and this was allegedly this progressive alternative school and I you know, and then I, I felt so much shame. And my dad was the one who had to look at the principal and say, you know, um, this isn't Madigan at all. Um, her mother is a heroin addict. And just he, it was the first time, actually, that I heard my dad say to somebody else outside of our family. And I had so much shame. I just started, you know, tears. Or I couldn't look her in the face. And I just I wanted to throttle her, to be honest. And then she... Uh, just no, it was so insensitive, you know. And I remember she looked at me and kind of put her hand on my shoulder and said, I know what you're going through. My husband is a chain smoker. <laughs> 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 and I remember my dad and I looked at each other. We kind of had a little chuckle. Like, mm. And part of me is going, okay, you upper middle class liberal. I don't, I, you know, I was 18 at the time, so radicalized. But me and my dad actually had this bonding thing where we're like, we know she means well. And, and thanks. And basically, like, can we go now? You know? Um, so you really managed to steer clear of the whole institutional thing, just completely suspicious of it from the very beginning. Totally, totally. And uh, I mean, coming off psychiatry, <laughs> you know, um, it just was instilled in me so early. But, but then also, you know, I, there's other family members who really needed help and stuff that couldn't be there any other way besides getting some disability and these kind of things. So then later I would really become an advocate of services and treatment on demand and harm reduction. And I started to learn a whole new language that wasn't just about um, judgment and shame, but was about systemic systems change. And I applied my <clears throat> experiences and passion and activism. And I started to then, um, because, you know, in the world of, of independent rock and all these things, there can be a bit of a separation between these political institutions and then the way we form relationships that are healing. Yeah, I'm definitely interested and want to talk to you about the mental health um, advocacy and activism that you do and your vision of what that's all about. But you mentioned the cello earlier. Yeah. When did the cello come in and mm. how, how did you develop this amazing, magical relationship? And tell us about that relationship. Yeah. Um, well, the, the story in a nutshell is that uh, I was in the fourth grade and at another school because I was always the new girl. And there was this, uh, luckily, thankfully, there was this Meet the Instruments Day. <clears throat> How old were you? Nine. Yeah. And they paraded all of the fourth graders into this cafeteria and they had all these instruments set up and there was some teachers and stuff. Um, and they were kind of uh, hurting kids in different directions and also letting them self-elect a bit. But, and I remember at first I went right for the trumpet and I put my mouth on the tune. They, I remember they had the little like mouthwash thing they would dip. It was just so silly when I think about it now. But, um, the woman though said to me, Oh no, I think, I think your mouth's all wrong for the trumpet. <laughs> okay. So I remember going to another line, you know, and, um, there was a violin, but the girl in front of me, it was so squeaky. And 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 then uh, I remember out of the corner of my eye seeing behind this piano a big violin. And I just, something clicked in me and I started saying, no, okay. And I think because I felt shut down by that woman, I was like, that's what I want. That What's what's that big violin? Can I, can I play that? Can I try that? And the woman was, oh, no, no, we decided we're not getting it out. We're not getting out. And she started to say, oh, but there's these flutes over here. And me even feeling again, because I was usually the kind of smallest 
girl in the room in the class. I was very small for my size. I was feeling really like she kept trying to send me, you know, to these little petite things. And I sort of lost it. I threw a tantrum. I started screaming, I want the big violin. That's what I want, the big violin. And um, finally, they pulled it out. And uh, she said, oh, okay, hands it to me. And I remember putting my arms around it, and it was just like the doll that my mom made me. It was like it was like hearing whisper in the door. I just running my hands on it and its body, and it felt like a woman's body or or my body or uh, so human yet wooden. And it took took me back to, you know, living in the teepees and the you know the trees and the forest. And then when I find that I held that bow with the horse hair. It's horsehair in the in the bow, you know. It just it's almost like it connected everything up to that point together. And I said, "What is it? What is this?" She said, "It's a cello." That was the first time I heard anybody say that word out loud. And I remember running home from school that day, and you know, my mom's at home, and she was I don't know doing bong hits or something, really loaded. <laughs> and I remember, mom, mom. I know, I know, I know what I'm going to do. I know what I want. I know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to play the cello. And I remember she looked over at me. She kind of smiled and she saw I was so happy. But then she, she just said, what the heck is that? <laughs> and even in that, even in that moment, I thought, yes, I'm going to make this amazing wooden thing I just had my arm around. I'm going to make it about us. I'm going to make it about my mom. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of make it who we are. And of, of course, that's exactly what I set out to do. <laughs> and then how did you go from um, the kind of like elementary school music classes into punk rock and Riot Girl with the cello? Because no one had really done that before. That's right. That's, well, what ended up happening is I just, it then became my lifelong companion like it continues to be. And I would, you know, I'd, there was plenty of schools I went to that didn't have orchestra programs or anything. So I'd, for, I'd ask them and gratefully they would bus me to schools that did so I do I can read you know thanks to the public schools and I really am an advocate of obviously arts and music programs being and just arts programs being available because as we know they're the last since even that time they've been drastically reduced which is terrifying but um I I would Always, I just started taking it on this alternate journey. I would do the orchestra thing, but it's so hierarchical. It's about chairs. It's kind of about shame. It's about, and usually the kids with the most money and the most would be up front and they'd have the private lessons. And I never had private lessons or anything like that. I mean, my dad tried really hard and he did at times try to say, well, what would, you know, you want to. But what ended up happening is actually I would stay after sometimes just making noises that weren't in the little Mozart suite we were working on. And I remember, luckily, in, in like the seventh or eighth grade, I had this teacher, Adrian Sabo, and I want to publicly thank Adrian Sabo mm -hmm. because she was kind of a younger music teacher and she was a cellist and a trombonist. And, the, and a lot of times the music teachers were usually violin players or something, so they, were, they would focus on that part of the orchestra. But she happened to be a cellist and she heard what I was doing and she said... Um, wow, do you want to continue to explore this? And I was like, yeah. And so I would stay after and kind of help her sweep up. And she would just, she started to introduce me to other things outside of classical music. There was this thing called strolling strings she showed me, which was kind of like dinner music, turn of the century, like small chamber works that were a little more um, 20th century. So that whetted my appetite. And then later um, I would end up in the school that I graduated from, which was like a performing arts School of the Arts and Humanities, um, college preparatory school. And it was kind of the, I knew it was kind of the end of my run of academia. I'm very, with all this unschooling stuff I had and being carted around, I kind of, by 15, 16, I was like, yeah, it's, you know, I'm over this game. I got too many interests. And, um, but I basically, I got into this school on a music and theater scholarship. And there weren't very many scholarship kids. But I told the orchestra director that I, didn't want to be there anymore, and I wanted to join, join the jazz band. And the jazz band was led by this guy, Floyd Staniford, who was actually a protege of Coltrane. And there was no other women in the jazz band. So I joined the jazz band with my cello, and um, Floyd introduced me to Coltrane's Naima, and that I taught myself that bass part on the cello, which is just like this liturgical heartbeat of one of the most beautiful, I think, pieces of jazz music as far as just soothing, healing music. And um, 
And then I was in, you know, Seattle in the early 90s and this and I started to I was the singer. I, you know, started to become with all the jazz band guys and blah, blah, blah. And we we started these punk bands. And and there was, of course, the whole Olympia scene. And, you know, so we started to, to drive down to Olympia because that's where there was more all ages shows. And I just got exposed to this community of punk that was really an ideology of find your creative voice and share it with us. And I was seeing performance and music and words that you know, I'd never heard on the radio or seen on TV or um, just my kind of exposure. And I just, um, I, I started, you know, I, I had always started writing, turning my poems and those sounds I was making with the cello into songs. And I also had taught myself guitar with some of my dad's help because there was, you know, the poor man's piano, there's usually an acoustic guitar. We couldn't take a piano around everywhere we move, but we could take an acoustic guitar. And so um, with those skills, I started to write songs uh, and just learning other songs through books or traditional songs or um, House of the Rising Sun was one of the first songs I taught myself, actually. Um, and, and then I just knew that I could bring the cello on the journey with me because, hey, that was even more punk than, you know, <laughs> to me. It was almost like I was hearing a lot of the calling out, people doing the louder, explosive the music that was really energetic and discordant. And, and I, I started to realize, wow, I could do this with what I had access to, these acoustic instruments. And instead of having it be an outward explosion of energy and um, rage and uh, voicing, you know, voice of people who are marginalized and silenced, that I could, I could do it by kind of going in and drawing people closer and having them lean in and we when I started Tattletale with this woman Jen Wood who was at that high school with me I saw her playing um, the guitar the acoustic guitar in the hallway and I just said are you writing songs she's very shyly like oh well I don't know not really not and I was like kind of sounds like you got some songs there or something and finally she took me back to her house and played me and that and I just said well look I've been working on this stuff and like we got to do a band. We got you, you want to write songs with me, and it just became this organic thing. And next thing you know, we're you know we're playing at these hardcore boys shows where you know they got their shirts off and it's hardcore mute, straight edge music and all this stuff. And then the sort of then when it was our turn to play, we would play right in the middle of the mosh pit where all that energy just was without any mics or anything. And we would just get in the middle of that space and we'd play these songs and these like teenage shirtless sweaty boys would just sit down and lean in and kind of touch each other and they're listening to us. You know, she was 15 at the time. I had maybe just turned 17. And, um, you know, I was having, people were crying. It was like this, we didn't have access to that. And, in this community, especially a youth community that's so about, oftentimes about high energy, but to have the energy be about looking in and listening, and then to actually emotionally respond and make ourselves emotionally vulnerable to each other, to me, that became what was missing from our community. And I really, and it spoke so profoundly to me. And I've really dedicated um, my craft uh, to that where the micro and the macro have this symbiotic link. Yeah, tell us about how you go about creating songs because there's some kind of magical channeling <sighs> visioning that's going on there. So how does how is it how is it that you're able to tap into that energy? Oh, wow. You know, it's been such um it's very fluid and kind of cyclical and it expands and changes a lot. Um, a lot of times I'll have either a feeling, some words, an idea, or I'll have a bit of a, me- a melody or tones, and then I'll just throw them out kind of into the ether, and they'll start to cycle back to me. I feel like I'm actually constantly writing, like because I'm just, I'm a note taker and observer and a, a sort of live wire for this moment. And every moment to me is kind of a, an alive electric organic data that I'm conversing with. And this is really what keeps me excited about being in this reality right now, keeps me away from what I call my deep pressing end or my relationship to suicide as a choice and as, you know. Um, and I, the cello, I, I can't tell you, it's so interesting. Just whenever I, 
it's almost like there's always something waiting there to reveal itself to me. And am I in a position to hear it and absorb it? And then what can I kind of sculpt with it? And it's very emotional. And sometimes it's very small. Um, and then things will develop out of it. And it's been everywhere from where I've written a few words and had these melodies or just tones, and then I let go of them literally for years. And then they come back and reveal what they need to be now, and I let them go. Um, sometimes finishing, you know, because I'm almost, I'm almost like a jazz or blues person that way, where it's a vamp or an idea, and it's there to be exp- – it's there for the moment to inform what – it needs to say or be, you know. Um, And sometimes, though, I've definitely had the experience where I sit down and there's just a story or, um, you know, something I need to say and it just presents itself. Like my song Scraps, for example, it was one of the first times that I just put the cello up on my lap like a big um, ukulele or a big guitar or something. And I just started plucking out this melody and these words started coming to me. And I was just singing the song Scraps, this very much about longing and letting go and the process of love and being loved and wanting but can't saying you want and do they want me? And it was, you know, because I was always very self-conscious about writing quote unquote love songs or being singer, you know, because I also came from these punk communities, you know, that and sometimes I'd say, oh, those hum and strum people with their, you know, I was, <laughs> I was very aware of that. But so this song is so interesting to me. Because it just, it was almost like um, two hours or less of me just going through and the song was there. And it actually, and then later that song would be used as the end title credits in movies. And, but it just wanted to be out in the world. <laughs>
your house from scraps Make a home out of loves And love So you mentioned that you um, you feel like you're a, like a live wire for the present moment, which is an amazing idea of being receptive to the universe. Is there a way in which that kind of vulnerability can be difficult? Is it challenging? Does it kind of affect your wellness and sustainability? And how do you kind of keep yourself kind of on an even keel with all these mm-hmm. energies and forces that you're working with? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It. Um, yeah, I, I think I first started to really notice my sensitivities about how I was being conscious of how I could then communicate what was happening to me or how much I was feeling to the people around me. And the, and it was very hard for me, even, the, you know, usually it was just a few people I really loved or could love who I could admit vulnerabilities to, to, or that I couldn't handle everything that was happening. So oftentimes it would be me being so alive and aware and hearing seeing all the subtext, feeling the nuance, you know, having the white elephant like want to scoop me up. And I felt like I oftentimes, too, was the one who had to say what nobody wanted to say. And and then people would get scared of me, though, because it was but I didn't know how to ex- that that truth, the sort of hard truth, the you know, people start would start to expect it from me. And then they'd become freaked out, you know, challenged by because it was almost like I couldn't not express or I didn't know how to express it in a way that was compassionate or Or maybe in a way that, you know, I don't always have to be the one who says it or that had taken me a long time. But what it did, it alienated me from a lot of people. So I I related to the isolation. And I had so much of my own trauma, like after my mom died and people really close to me kind of couldn't handle it. People who were close to me and didn't know that she was using heroin. And and then I, I it started kind of a process of abandonment. And a lot of people would die in my life and my family. So then I I was so aware of mortality and our relationship to it that um that was really the hard thing was the isolation stuff and then just the few people that I could feel really close to kind of bombarding them with the stuff that I didn't want the rest of the world or kind of a public world to know was happening with me um and it was after this process of feeling like I was burning out my lovers and friends or else you know um and being more aware too that okay I need to put more of my healing in my own hands um, as far as how I eat and when I eat that has always been a big one for me Um, how I create time and a schedule that is healing and I don't feel judged by it if I need to be in the world sleeping from 6 a.m. to noon you know not to feel like I'm bad and being judged because this is where I'm at and have people support that and then most significantly of course um when I really started to look at my relationship to wanting to die and when that was happening or because there was friends, peer artists of mine who were in this series of time taking their own life too and that kept coming back. Like why are these amazing artists who are my mentors and stuff burning out so quickly? Like uh, Kurt Cobain and other people. Yeah, and then Jeff Buckley and then um, of course Elliot Smith who I had performed and worked with. Um, th- we were both working with the Kill Rock Stars label. I found it was actually September 10th, 2001, that I went to a mental health association conference um, for people with compulsive hoarding and cluttering kind of issues in their lives. And I felt because this live wire sentimentalized a lot of stuff, and it was actually this eviction, and my partner said, I can't, your stuff everywhere, the way you're, you know, everything became, you know, the socks that I'd wore the day before had some poetic message. I had to keep them right there. No, don't move them yet. You know, it was, and she just said, I, I, I kind of, I think maybe you should check this out or something. And I ended up going to this conference and, well, I was started going to the support meetings 
Her, and um, then the kind of position of facilitator moderator was sort of offered to me, and I I put in a bid for the position, and it ended up that it was funded by um, a class la- action lawsuit, people who had been mistreated by the mental health system, and I was then hired on a third time to be a third time uh, mental health advocate and doing systems change and also looking at um, housing and homelessness and access and reasonable accommodation for people with mental health, um, quote unquote, disabilities. And so I, I, this whole community was opened up to me and I would go on this really cool journey that would eventually lead me to the Icarus Project and becoming then a part of the collective uh, that we're doing now. But that time was very um, important, that bridge. And um, it definitely made me committed to um, the political work of how we, when we make this like treatment on demand and harm reduction as really important examples, you know, the kinds of access people have, we really are, uh, we're saving lives together by changing the lack of choice and the lack of information um, and, and creating um, options for making this world livable, you know. And what about for you now? What is it that's inspiring for you? What kind of vision are you really working from these days? Well, I think now that I've found and am a part of cultivating and this community that is talking about the experiences that get pathologized, the experiences that get called mental illness, um, I have access to so many people now who are talking about states of conscious and mood extremes. And this is the kind of journey that I feel safe talking about my own experience with all those things. And so um, the kind of writing, the community, the support, of course, now being one of the founding collective members of Icarus and really looking at power sharing, horizontalism, how we are in mutual aid with each other um, to share the resources and be the kind of community um, that we're, you know, I, I like to say we are the web that we weave together to save our own lives and to create a world worth not only living in, but um, living, thriving in, you know, a world worth being excited to contribute to. Because that's, you know, that's something that I think my mother didn't quite get in her lifetime. And that's definitely fuels my plight. And it's, making beautiful collaborative projects and albums and touring and speaking and learning from communities of creativity and resistance. And I'm getting to go to Chiapas for the first time and being a child who has always been involved and finding my own indigenous core and being around indigenous peoples. And um, this feels like a very exciting time in a kind of global awakening way for um the humble, simple people, as the Zapatistas like to say, but for all of us to um, to heal. Thanks a lot for joining us on Madness Radio, Bonfire, Madigan, Shive. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to an interview with Bonfire, Madigan, Shive, and uh, the music clip that we listened to was called Scraps. It's um, originally from Saddle the Bridge, uh, which is um, no longer in print, but you can get... Um, I Bleed, A Decade of Song, which is an anthology of Madigan's music, um, by going to her great website, bonfiremadigan.com. There's a lot of really interesting stuff up there, photos and information about um, Madigan's life and work. And also be on the lookout for uh, the Seven Stories Press anthology that's going to be including a chapter that Madigan wrote. Um, Madigan's also working with Madness Radio to do some co-hosting of upcoming shows, so um, stay tuned for that. And also, um, she's been working really hard for the last couple of years on a new album. Very exciting. I've had the um, fortune of hearing some of the new songs from this album, and I think there's a couple of things on her website that you can listen to, and it's absolutely amazing, mind-blowing, inspiring, visionary uh, music that defies all uh, all categorization. Definitely comes out of the punk rock spirit, but brings a lot of classical and folk um, and hip hop influences. So we'll be looking forward to Madigan's new album to be released soon. That's about all the time we have this week for Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in.
You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is broadcast every Wednesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3 Valley Free Radio in Northampton, Massachusetts. For our live internet stream, podcasting, show archives, and more, visit madnessradio.net. Madness Radio is co-produced by Freedom Center and The Icarus Project. For more information, check out freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. For more mental health radio, listen to the news hour from mindfreedom.org, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, or you just want to share what's in your head, contact us at radio at madnessradio.net. 